Hi, my name is Mike Kelly. I'm VP of Advanced Package and Technology Integration at Amcor Technologies, headquartered in Tempe, Arizona. I'm going to talk today about heterogeneous packaging and optimizing performance and cost, some of the trends that we're seeing, and some of the solutions that we're developing. The agenda is uh, first to take a look at silicon trends because they do end up driving a lot of what's going on in the advanced packaging arena, especially when it comes to heterogeneous. And then uh, translate those into trends in IC packaging and uh, solutions in the heterogeneous space. So, you know, I, in, the, in the last few years, last five years, the push into the data center and high performance uh, GPU and ASIC based processors with integrated HBM DRAM really got the modern era for heterogeneous packaging started. All this data that needed to be processed from all of these uh, connected devices and algorithms trained uh, drove the need for pushing H memory and logic together on a silicon interposer. And that was, uh, that was the first step. That, that actually was responsible for getting the supply chain ready in many ways for what we see as the, the, the push towards heterogeneous packaging. And, and now, of course, those solutions are being, uh, those algorithms are being pushed out further, but it's, 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 it's gone far beyond uh, the AI applications these days, heterogeneous, Packaging is reaching uh, more broadly into the data center, but also down into the consumer space as well. So uh, it's it's having a broad impact. We're seeing it across the 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 spectrum of commercial interests. First, silicon trends. So for sure, transistor scaling is uh, continuing to march on. The density improvements have been phenomenal. The, the fabs uh, continue to find ways to keep density improvements moving along. True, it's not exactly following Moore's law anymore, but it, it is still a tremendous uh, scaling that is, that is continuing. Um, maybe more interesting, or at least as interesting as that from the packaging standpoint, is the fact that all this transistor scaling, transistor miniaturization, transistor density improvements, is, is actually pushing power density up still. So power per unit of area is still marching upward. And this plays into the drivers and, that are pushing customers to think about other ways for integrating functionality. Certainly trend, uh, the trends on costs are, are going in the wrong direction. Uh, wafer costs continue to accelerate you can see on the left-hand graph, there's a very big inflection point at 16 nanometer, and then a much uh, steeper rise as more and more technology goes into the wafer. Not surprisingly, the, the uh, wafer prices are accelerating. And just as important is the cost for design. So uh, design time and design cost is going up. So every time you need to do a product design and push it into a new node, it's, it's a big cost in several different ways. Here is the, uh, you know, EUV is obviously required to get to where we are on, on uh, current wafer nodes, but it isn't a cheap process. And so this is part of the cost picture as well. From an IC packaging trend, so taking a look at the, at at these product trends and how they drive packaging and the implications for such. On the left-hand side, uh, a primary one is memory bandwidth. That's been a, a, a very important factor in, in AI, uh, getting HBM DRAM stacks close to the processor, uh, basically getting a lot more memory bandwidth at a lower power point. So you're not pushing all that data back and forth off package, you know, all the way out to other forms of memory. That was, that was the first one we talked about earlier that uh, pushed heterogeneous packaging. Wafer costs and higher L count are a couple of examples. So clearly wafer costs makes you think about what portion of your product really needs to be on the current node. 
and what portions of your product might not be. Uh, I pick on I.O. Uh, drivers as an example. Uh, very complex RF uh, high-speed 30s I.O. drivers are, are were kind of the low-hanging fruit that we saw a few years ago. I take those, put, pull them out of the out of the central ASIC or the central processor and create discrete die. That enables you to uh, have a, a die that you could reuse, but it also takes the I.O. off the side of the main die so that if you need more I.O., you don't necessarily have to grow your die to accommodate it. You're just growing the number of I.O. connections out to your I.O. die. Um, and on power, power hits us in two different ways. Certainly in dissipated power, um, dissipating higher power, uh, better TIMs, better LIDs, um, those, those kinds of solutions are getting a lot more scrutiny now than ever because of the increasing power density, but also the power delivery network, PDN. So getting a stable voltage supply to what it, where you are needed in the die, whether it's that's the I.O. or the core, is a bigger and bigger job. And we're seeing more and more designs paying special attention to where this bypass charge storage is, is located. And of course, closer is better. So we're going to talk more about that in the future, too. But that's definitely a, a first order trend that we are seeing. This is a, an overview slide that uh, is, is meant to depict the different segments where we see heterogeneous packaging intersecting. Over on the far left, wafer cost, design cost, power increases, IP reuse, time to market, those are general considerations for heterogeneous or not. If, you, if you've got a discrete die, let's say it's an IO die, high speed series die, something like this, um, and you could reuse that die for not just this product, but for the next couple of products, that's time to market. You know, that's design resources, it's IP reuse, and um, you know, it's, it's also helping on design costs as well. Um, power dissipation and better PDN, uh, this, this kind of overlays most of the heterogeneous that we're gonna talk about. I'll pick on it a little bit later. But by segment, um, if you're talking about, you know, deep learning and AI, that definitely is more memory, uh, more memory bandwidth, and getting memory closer and closer to the processor or ASIC. In the networking space, I.O. count is always a premium. So, you know, the total tr bandwidth of the, of the switch or router is a function of the I.O. that it can access and the speed of those I.O. For server, you know, uh, the ability to pull I.O. drivers off of the main chip and leave the, the, the uh, cutting edge node transistors to do the logic functions required inside the CPU uh, is, is twofold. You have more gates that you can use for compute and your I.O. Uh, is out there and, and possibly enabling addressing more DRAM as required. This is an interesting segment too. PCs and the client space, there's certainly more interest in that now. As I mentioned before, uh, this is not just a data center play. It definitely is getting a lot of uh, traction in lower cost points where mixing silicon nodes or maybe mixing functionalities on, on uh, smaller module and smaller packages are definitely uh, a strong wave that we're seeing. So from a, from a package differentiation standpoint, definitely the die-to-die -die interface is important. If you've got heterogeneous system, you've got multiple die that need to talk to one another, there's two primary ways to go about that. Um, there are subtle differences uh, inside of each of these, of course, but for a parallel interface, uh, typically it's a a fairly simple I.O. driver, a smaller driver, maybe a single-ended uh, uh, application. In tip, and typically, it's got more physical lines to get the data uh, and bandwidth accomplished. That goes hand-in-hand, hand, typically with lower latency and lower power, but you're trading off more physical lines, which means the package has more work to do in getting things routed between one another. Serial interfaces, of course, been around for a long, long time also. The, the nice thing about a serial interface is you're serializing the bit stream. So every single bit doesn't have to go down a single physical wire. Um, that comes with a trade-off, just like everything. Uh, usually a little higher latency, a few more clock cycles, and typically higher power. 
How does that translate into uh, what 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 for packaging? How does that translate into package space? Um, typically, parallel interfaces that we see today. HBM bus is a decent example. 1024 wide. Uh, that's a lot of fine line uh, signals, and so those type of products will end up in some kind of module. So today, you know, in HVM, that's 2.5 DTSV, so a silicon interposer. Substrate Swift is Amcor's uh, uh, trademark for high density fan out, which is a copper polyamide dielectric multi multi metal stack interposer technology. S Connect is uh, Amcor's uh, uh, technology for providing local density or also literally for providing more room under the die for bridges and or IPDs. And I'll talk a little bit more of that uh, towards the end of the talk. If, you're, if, you're, if you have serial interfaces and more importantly, if you have few enough physical wires between the die to get routed, there's a good chance you can do it in an MCM. So a, a, a multi-layer buildup type substrate uh, has enough routing density to be able to accomplish this for many of the interfaces we see today. And if you can stay in an MCM, great. You know, there's the MCMs have been around for a good long while. Um, what we have done lately is really improve on the uh, densification and uh, design rules to permit die location much closer together than we used to. 2.5D TSV. Uh, I only have one slide in here. This is an HVM. This is a, a snapshot of some typical products that we have. Um, all of these, without exception, I think are ASIC or processor and some kind of HVM stack. Um, and, you know, the trend in AI is more and more, more and more HVM, more and more memory bandwidth. So sizes are increasing and uh, we're addressing that as well. I want to jump over to Substrate Swift. That's Amcor's trademark for high density fan out. Um, it is a uh, it, it is a replacement for the silicon interposer. Um, I think it is actually a more flexible solution than that. But if you move from left to right, 2.5D was sort of the benchmark. Uh, that's where we got started with a lot of these heterogeneous designs. Getting DRAM, uh, uh, yeah, getting DRAM in the form of HBM stacks and uh, ASICs or processors co-located on an interposer. And then, uh, you know, in the last few years, migrating these kinds of systems to HDFO, HDFO and substrate, meaning a module that is fabricated at the wafer level and then singulated and uh, handled like a very large die as it goes on to the flip chip assembly line. Uh, the, the logic plus uh, HBM combinations dominate that space. Um, there are a few exceptions to that, but mostly it is uh, uh, HBM plus logic. Now, now I think we're, you know, in the last couple of years, we've been very much in exploring the diversification and addressing uh, uh, other markets with heterogeneous, especially in the area of finding very optimum points for performance versus cost. Smaller systems, smaller die, mixed nodes. Uh, mixed silica nodes, uh, the high performance, you know, compute space, the compute blocks may need to stay in the current node and, and a section of it may not be able, may not need the most current node and can take some of the less expensive nodes to fabricate that. That is a very, uh, that is a very uh, current trend and there seems to be a, a strong trend towards that. Just a quick comparison between 2.5D and Substrate Swift. Again, an interposer with TSVs. This is typically 100 micron thick, functional die, substrate, uh, cutaway cross section looks like this. In, in the uh, RDL interposer space, high density fan out, um, very, very analogous really. The, the copper layers and the stack up tend to be uh, in total thickness thinner because they're fabricated uh, with wafer carriers and so that the uh, the, sil the bulk silicon has been removed. Essentially, this is just copper and organic dielectric, the functional die, 
the interconnect bumps between that module, which is shown over here, and down to the main substrate. Yields have to be high. Yields, uh, you know, defect density needs to be very low in order for yields for very large modules. Some of these are, you know, uh, 25 or 35 units per wafer. So if your defect density isn't managed very tightly, uh, yields will, will get away from you. But today, you know, we're in the 99% yield in both case for fabricating RDL and uh, moving to 1.5 micron line in space in, in uh, 2021 this year. Just a quick couple of pictures. Um, this is very typical for a four layer construction. Um, stack vias and uh, lots of AI, AOI, which is the uh, tool to ensure that every layer uh, that is built up uh, meets the quality standards and, and uh, yield standards that we have to have for these parts. Four layers typical today and uh, six layer uh, development is uh, ongoing this year. Another thing that you know is, is worth mentioning is uh, enhancing detectability. Certainly process improvements for surface roughness make this uh, part of the solution. Also AI, uh, uh, AOI detectability and algorithm improvements is something we're constantly working at to make sure that what we're capturing is truly a defect and that we're not missing defects and they're not mischaracterizing defects. So a lot of work has gone into that to get up to these 98 uh, and 99% uh, yield numbers. So just real quick on, on status, um, for multi-logic designs, we have several examples which have gone through package quals. We are working on uh, the logic plus HBM, which essentially would be a, a lower cost replacement for silicon interposer. Those package uh, quals are ongoing. And then the, the last uh, space I want to mention is uh, what I would call the chiplet space. That is a very, very active uh, number of prototypes being uh, developed in this space. Typically smaller die, uh, typically not HBM. Um, and, you know, the, the idea, again, is two, two different veins, mixed nodes of silicon for... Uh, separating logical functions inside of what was a single die or mixed uh, uh, technologies, RF and logic, for example. Real quickly, uh, electrical comparisons. So we've got a, a, Z, a Z direction comparison here. In other words, a path down through the interposer, uh, whether it be a TSV in 2.5V or whether it would be a via stack in HDFO substrate SWIFT. And then over here is the XY routing. So, you know, in assertion loss comparison between the two, um, because of the organic dielectrics, you're definitely getting lower insertion loss uh, passing through multi layers of HDFO versus a single uh, TSV in the TSV case. In the frequency domain, you know, taking a look at the eye diagrams, not ex unexpectedly. The eye diagram is more open in the substrate swift case. These particular simulations uh, were characterized at four gig, four gigabit per second. This is uh, just a, a slide that depicts how we believe, you know, HDFO and uh, and substrate swift is positioned electrically. So certainly for HBM interfaces, you know, whether it's HBM two, two E, or three, um, the the two point five D interposer. Uh, being the substrate type in this case is at, is it can handle the electrical speeds that should be okay. Once you're talking about heterogeneous integration of of uh, chiplets or or uh, other combinations of multiple die in a module, oftentimes those speeds are not going to be in the single digit gigabits per second. Um, we, we're talking today uh, about most of them lying in the five to twenty gig. Uh, five to 20 gigabit per second range. This is an area we think that the polyamide dielectric and the stack up construction we're using uh, easily addresses that. It's a very, uh, a very uh, good place to be addressed by HDFO. Um, not to, not, not to uh, shortchange PDN, but again, managing the power supply network 
This is a, just an example and some simulations. Places you can locate bypassing. You know, the, the ones we all know are bypass caps on the top side of the package. Those really aren't going away. But as, as people are moving to five nanometer, uh, seven nanometer, five nanometer, and looking ahead to three, definitely looking at getting bypass closer to the die. And, you know, there are uh, technologies out there that allow you to put some of these in the core of the substrate, um, certainly underneath the package on the ball side is a common place today, so, so land side caps. And, uh, uh, and most recently, we've been looking at how to get bypass cap even closer. And even closer in this case means right under the die, right under what is really, you know, 40 or 50 microns of, of uh, copper and organic dielectric stack, so very close. These simulations are just showing the difference between uh, with regard to PDN impedance between having a, a capacitor located here and having a capacitor located here. And what you want to avoid are, are these resonances that you see here. This one was at about 64 megahertz. Yes, that's megahertz, not gigahertz, sorry. Um, and, you know, that is, that is a, a function of what that uh, total impedance looks like on the uh, power delivery to that location. If you get the bypass cap directly under the IO phi in this case, it was uh, pretty much clean all the way out to 100 meg. So a sizable improvement. One of the last slides I have here is just taking a, a slightly deeper dive on that subject. So again, with the idea of wanting to put bypassing really close and having the option of doing this uh, in conjunction with HDFO. So the routing layers here are still HDFO for general purpose IO or external IO. But if you need to get a bypass cap really close, this is one of the ways we are developing uh, to address that. And essentially you have these copper pillar pass-throughs for things for signals and power delivery that need to exit the package. The, in this case, the uh, high density routing is accomplished with the, with the high density fan out layers and you have a local uh, bypass cap uh, IPD type. Thin is required in this case. So uh, that space can also be used for applying a bridge concept. So the, you know, we have seen several different types of bridges out there. Silicon is the most common. That's, uh, that's taking place in several different kinds of package technologies. We're also working on a molded bridge. This would be fabricated in our own uh, high density fan out line and molded. And uh, with tall copper pillars, you could achieve essentially a pass through uh, power supply approach for that bridge as well. Uh, in the instance that you need to power up, uh, for instance, IO phi's on both sides. So this is definitely in development, but is something that uh, we're looking at both for the IPD, both for proximity of bypass and charge storage and bridge concepts. Here's just a couple of cross sections sewing these. Here's the silicon bridge and cross section. Uh, this is actually the molded bridge and cross section with the uh, large tall copper pillar pass-throughs that uh, would be part of that uh, construction as well. And then th this is my last slide on content is basically the, the, the bump pitch progression and roadmap. If you're out here uh, below 10 microns, you are definitely talking about copper-copper hybrid, so-called hybrid bonding, um, no solder involved, just uh, time, temperature, and pressure. We have taken uh, a, a lot of work to get copper pillar, standard copper pillar to its ultimate density. So we have done high volume prototyping at 18 micron pitch. That's still possible with copper pillar lead free solder for small die. Somewhere between that and 10 microns, you're definitely going to want to consider uh, hybrid bonding. Uh, that is something that we have in pathfinding as well. 
and um, it all started not that long ago with some of the 2.5D products, which were pushing us down into the 40 and 40, 45 and 40 micron pitch. It's worth mentioning that, you know, copper pillar and lead-free caps um, can easily scale down to 30 micron pitch. We've demonstrated that on reasonable size die. So, you know, whether you're scaling uh, down to smaller copper pillar pitches or whether you're really needing to go push into uh, another domain with really fine line pitch. Those are kind of the big questions you need to ask. But I think uh, from a 30, a 30 micron pitch standpoint, that is definitely doable in standard copper lead free pitch. Uh, sorry, standard copper lead free bump. Just to conclude real quickly, um, silicon costs and complexity you know, are, are forcing a reevaluation. It's, it's really the ongoing quest for maximizing performance and that ratio with cost and we, you know we've talked about it many times it's all over in the literature how do we keep moore's law going well moore's law in that sense really means how are we going to keep performance per dollar going and this is one of the primary paths uh, for the next uh, foreseeable future that is that is causing uh, things like chiplets to be created so that we can recombine them at the MCM and HDFO level. Uh, you can reuse a piece of silicon over and over and over for multiple products that's saving you time and that's saving you design time and time to market. It's IP reuse. Um, we think this trend is, is growing quickly. And as we transition from five to three, that trend is only going to intensify. Uh, so the last thing I want to mention is that, you know, Amcor is uh, working diligently to be prepared for the heterogeneous solutions that, that you will need for the future. And with that, thank you. And it's been good to talk to you. Bye for now.